are in week three of a sermon series called American Idol. And in this sermon series, we've been diving into each week one idol that we as American Christians have to face. That it's around in our culture or it's tempting us to put something else on the highest throne of our lives or next to God on the highest throne of our lives. And today, I think we picked the music on purpose because we're talking about uh, nationalism, about power, right? So, so far, we've considered the American idols of self and ideology, right? We just preached uh, the past two weeks, and they were incredible sermons. Go back and listen to them. Even if you were here, even if you've already heard them, go listen to them again, like, once a month and see what happens. Honestly, they were on, you were on fire, Chase. So our, our conversation for today is different from those two in a lot of ways, but it's also quite philosophical. It's kind of, you can't really put your finger on it, right? And that idol is America itself. So I just want to start with the question, have you made an idol out of your country? When you think of a city on a hill, what first comes to mind? Do you think of the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 5, or do you think of the United States of America? Honestly, I was raised to think the United States of America is supposed to be a shining city on a hill. God has blessed us so much so that we could turn around and bless everyone else. We are exceptional. We here on this land are exceptional. Whether you want to be here or not, wherever your people came from, we're not going to untangle all of these wild things. Uh, But very early in the European history of this country, Actually, people write down old sermons from, like, hundreds of years ago, and you can, like, find them on the Internet, and you can read them. So I, I like reading those sometimes, but I promise I'm really fun at parties. Okay, <laughs> invite me to your parties. <laughs> there was a guy named John Winthrop who was a preacher in 1630. He preached a sermon that was called A Model of Christian Charity. And in this sermon, he equated America to a city on a hill. Ever since it has been in the water we drink, we've been tempted in every way to think of this place, this idea, this nation, as somehow God's chosen exceptional nation. When we're questioning whether we have made an idol out of our country, we can ask ourselves a few questions to kind of get us thinking, right? How close is America to God's will? Do you think God approves of everything that America has done? Do you trust America to do the church's work in taking care of the poor, the widow and fatherless, and the sojourner? Or refugee? Maybe that's a better word for our, our culture, right? Does America give you what you should be getting from God? Ultimately, that's the deepest question. Is Do you find in your nation, and this applies to more than just America, we're just mostly Americans here, do you find in your nation what God should be giving you? Any attempt to put a nation on the highest throne of your life is Christian nationalism. Right? So we're going to move to that. A Christian nationalism is an ideology where a group of Christians believe that their nation or the nation they're part of is inside the special will of God. For our context, they would say things like, America is a Christian nation and we should be taking steps to keep it that way. Or like I have in this slide, America is God's chosen nation. Or this one that I'm still working through, right? America's success depends on its obedience to God. If you're saying things like that, you've confused the will of God with the will of humanity, really. Christian nationalists will see a blessing of God stretching all over the people of God throughout from Abraham through to the Exodus and on through to Christian times ultimately until his blessing gets to this land, to North America itself. As if God chose this land specially as a new promised land for his people to inhabit. Listening to sermons from 400 years ago brings up two things. One, that guy was so wrong, right? (laughs) That guy was so wrong. And I wonder, you know, who's going to be listening to our sermons 400 years from now? That's, I don't know what to think about that. Whether for good or for ill, maybe they'll say we were wrong, right? As a Christian occupying this land, we need only to obey God, institute his laws, and rake in his blessings. That's what they think, okay? To their mind, America is a Christian nation. 
And it must stay that way if we are to follow God. Forget stepping on toes. It feels to some of you like I may have taken a baseball bat to the back seat, the back leg of your chair. Right? I'm thinking of those plastic chairs that everyone has outside that are really flimsy and they break all the time. Take a baseball bat to that. Rather than stepping on your toes, that's what it might feel like. But I need to say, nationalism is not the same as patriotism. Okay, these are two very different things. Two very different things. Thank you. It is okay to say it is good to be an American, and you can definitely be proud to be one. We should, none of us should be nationalists, and it's totally okay if we are patriots. Okay? In fact, we should pray for our nation. That's clear through Scripture. Thanking God for everything he's given us, asking for his provision and blessing for the people who run it, because he's instructed us to do that. Just without the desire to manipulate our country and our culture into honoring God when it never will on its own, and God never promised it would either. Okay? The problem comes when we see God's will as intertwined with any nation. The ones in the nation can follow God, but it is futile to try and steer the country and culture that way, after God's will. This doesn't just happen, again, in our nation. It was a temptation for Christians in many nations down through history. A person who is a patriot loves their country. They don't think they are the moral guardian of how it goes. And it is virtuous to seek the country where we live to make it the best it can be. Right? There's plenty of space for conscious political involvement, just not coercion through power. Right? It just can't be by that manipulation and power grabbing. When we submit to Christian nationalism, we forget that our primary citizenship is in heaven, right? So that being said, all that being said about patriotism is not nationalism. If you ever see a flag of any nation on this stage for giving honor and respect to, we have left Christ. Okay? Not because we reject our status as citizens here, in fact, I love living here for a lot of reasons. What we do reject is the tendency to make this American citizenship supreme in our lives. The temptation to idolatry of nation comes when we don't keep track of who gets respect and who gets glory. Right? One of the quickest things I learned from Chase when I got here was there's a difference between glory and honor, or glory and respect. Right? Honor and respect are due. You, you do something to earn them. But glory is only for God. Glory is only for God, and Lord, yeah, amen. We'll only give God glory here. That brings us to our first verse for, for today, uh, Philippians 3, verse 20. And it's kind of in the middle of a sentence, and there's a lot going on beside it. But ultimately, we see this. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, we're... To be a Christian is to wait in hopeful anticipation of when he will make things right again. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, from heaven, not from the power structures of this world, not from military might and nations that can be more powerful and stronger and win wars against other nations. Our Savior comes from heaven. Right? So we know we are citizens of the world made right, the world that's coming. Uh, which comes after the day of the Lord and makes us sojourners in this world, right? We're travelers, we're foreigners in this world, not because God's going to save us before he burns it all up, right? That's an unhelpful way of thinking. Actually, God has promised that he will make the world new again, and we get to be part of that now and then. So praise God for that, right? So God is the only one who gets or deserves glory, or honor here before his assembled church. No one and nothing else. Ultimately, this all boils down to the idolatry of power, right? So power is on the highest throne of our lives if we've submitted to Christian nationalism or any number of another ideas. We've put power and ability and coercion at the top. When that's a worldly thing, that's the way the world works. That's not the way the kingdom of God works, right? So we've talked about self, we've talked about ideas, and now it's kind of ability slash power slash, you know, trusting in things that aren't God. Nations are based on having power. To be a nation is to stand up in a room full of people with very big guns and say, I am powerful enough to survive. Try and tell me otherwise, right? That's why Independence Days matter. 
because they stood up to the one who was in charge of them previously. To be a nation, the government in it has to rely on its own power to last. If we as Christians fall into this way of thinking, we mix God with a lot of earthly things, namely power by coercion. Okay. That brings us to the next verse for today. It's John 18, verse 36. I promise I don't preach like this very much where I'm just giving you one verse here and there. But that's how it felt today. It was more of a... Anyway, I've tried to be obedient to God. And here's our second verse for today. John 18... <laughs> John 18, verse 36, Jesus said he's, he's being arrested by the Roman uh, po uh, police structure and he's being tried for whether he's going to be crucified or not. And he says, uh, Pilate is questioning him. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So that, that fight thing kind of makes me think about like, Christian pacifism and, and nonviolence, and I'm really wrestling with that, and that's not what today's about. Ultimately, Jesus said, the power in his kingdom does not come from the sword. It doesn't originate with an idea made up by humanity, a sharp thing that can make people do what you want, right? Ultimately, his kingdom is, is upside down. It's backwards. It's a different thing. We may think we're doing good if we align ourselves with the will of the nation, uh, being the moral guardians of the U.S., you know, getting this law changed or getting that program shut down or whatever. We're desiring to, you know, God's blessings over our military efforts, right? At least the ones we deem are righteous. But to the Christian who finds himself enamored with the promise of safety, peace, and prosperity as it comes through the nation, they may be submitting to the idol of power, getting something from the world, what they should be getting from God. And God never promised prosperity either. He promised enough. They may be seeking after those good things at the expense of following Christ fully. They've hitched their trailer to both Jesus and everything that goes against Jesus. The outcomes of all these des desires are good and godly, that a nation would follow God or that its laws, uh, or that his laws are followed in some realistic and tangible way, right? That's why we've had the Ten Commandments posted on a lot of federal buildings throughout the history. It's a good desire. The outcome would be good. Even though we are desiring godly things, they come from the wrong motivations. Worldly power achieves its ends by coercion. It seems nice to think of the world going that way. Or maybe it seems nice to think that the kingdom of God could benefit from being attached to America or some other nation. But this is a myth. Okay, a falsehood that isn't even possible. A kingdom made up by humanity, it, it cannot follow God. So here's what I need you to hear today. If you hear nothing else, hear this. The term Christian nation, it's a myth. It's an oxymoron, right? We think of uh, deafening silence, right? It's two things that are opposite of each other. There's no such thing as a nation being Christian, okay? Okay? If you'll go with me here, I'll, I'll fill you guys in on what I mean. Nations have power. They have worldly power. They operate on coercion. But Christ calls us to humility. Nations have interests. Nations have things they want to happen, policies and, you know, foreign affairs and stuff. Christ has called us to die to the world. If you're a Christian, if you've been baptized, you're dead. You get nothing from the world anymore because you're waiting for the new one. We could talk about materialism, actually. That would have been good to put in here, but we didn't. But we get tempted to materialism and to, we get so distracted from the will of God that we think as Christians, oh, you know, I can make a little bit more money here. I'm going off script. Ultimately, we are, um, we are so tempted to find our worth and our power and our validity in this world that we are distracted from, from Christ's instructions for us. Lost my spot. Nations have borders and many people who aren't welcome. I'm not saying our nation shouldn't have borders. I'm just saying that's how nations should work. They have borders. But Christians should be willing to house the foreigner, to adopt the orphan, take care of the widow, house the refugee, right? We should be doing things like that rather than turning people away. 
nations use military might and power to coerce people with things like swords, right? A sharp thing that can make you do what I want. But Christians use love. Love is not coercive. We have power from God, yes. And that's the, the really interesting thing about the songs we sang today is that we have power from God. But it's that upside down power, right? It's power to defeat the enemy. It's not power to make people uh, be holy, right? That's kind of the point of the kids' sermon today was your job is just to love. You know, that's really the center of this sermon today is you might think you're serving God by, you know, using worldly power or working through the laws to get God's will to be done in the world. But really, that's coercion. Love is not coercive. We can't. Here's the one, one more word here. We cannot find, I have more words than that. We cannot find or follow God's will while not submitting in humility to God's methods. For the kingdom of God, the ends never justify the means. We win by losing, right? Winning for us is showing the world the character of Christ clearly by being his church, right? This, that's how this is all set up to work. We have to go about this his way or else what is this all for? America especially lends itself to this. It lends itself to tempting us to put power on the top throne of our lives. Our world depends on power to function, whether on a national level, like I keep saying, a country is you know, threatening powerful violence against those it deems enemies or unrighteous, or on a personal level, when a bad manager makes their employee do all of their work unfairly. Every system in this world is corrupted by the ability to take or remain in control. Every system that God didn't start has been started by humans and operates by human standards. So power can be abused. Conversely, the power of God that comes to a Christian is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to show the world cross-shaped love. We as Christians are to show cross-shaped love to the people who are living in the kingdom of the world. Jesus said it would be how we are known to be his disciples And it will make people wonder why we don't function in similar ways to what they instinctively assume to be right or best, right? That's the whole point of our witness is that people see and they're like, why do you love that person who you completely disagree with politically? Or how come you didn't participate in the fight at Thanksgiving when this person was, you know, people notice when we act different. Another way that we're tempted with power by our world is that they encourage political fighting, right? As followers of Christ, we have to reject power according to the world, and instead we found ourselves bowing at its altar. Are you getting your peace of mind from your chosen news cycle, like the channel you choose to watch? Oftentimes, we're not getting peace of mind from those channels, right? From either, any of them, right? you know, more than just either. Uh, Our American culture encourages that we go about gaining or holding on to power through political fighting. Many of us grew up being told that America has departed from its original godly roots, and it would take God's presidential candidate to bring us back into his will. This was all a worldly method to grab and hold on to power. We put our trust in humans when we should have been putting our trust in God, the only one who deserves it. I need to stop here for a minute. I don't bring this up to pit conservatives versus liberals, right? This isn't about that. I've seen it on both sides. Though it remains a more common issue on the conservative side. But siblings should look out for each other nonetheless. Okay? If I am committing adultery, no, idolatry. Well, adultery too. But if I'm committing idolatry, that's what I meant to say. (laughs) Both. I would want you to tell me. Right? I'd want you to tell me if I was committing idolatry. <laughs> All right. Because if you are really my brother or sister, I believe that you would want the best for me. I can trust that you want the best for me. And you shouldn't let me go on in my sin. Right? I don't mean that you can get into fights on Twitter or Facebook over this. Or that you can throw godliness out the door to fight at the next holiday that you gather for. Probably Thanksgiving. But in your real relationships with these people, look out for each other. Another way that we're tempted with power by our world is that it's all corruption and sin. All power systems are infected with corruption and sin. There's an old saying, right? Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
This has proved true over and over and over again. For all humans, since the first ones, each person is born under the effects of the fall. And through history, as fallen humans, whether they be kings and queens, or people with very big bombs, or the Pope, or any other Christian denominational leader, they all, with only one exception, have at least one thing in common, sin. All people in their nature are bent toward pursuing power in this corrupted way, and that power corrupts even the best desires. I hate to be that, like, young white pastor that refers to Lord of the Rings, but I have to, okay? (laughs) Thank you, Reese. Thank you, Reese. Toward the beginning of that story, there's, there's the ring of power that comes to uh, one of the characters. And another one, Gandalf says, I would take it to use it for good, but I know what it would do to me. He says something more, you know, catchy than that. But he knows what it would do to his desires. He knows that it was forged for the sake of power, for the sake of coercion. So he won't take it. We're challenged to refuse power in that same way. What we need is a redeemed vision for how God wants us to relate to power. Because the reality is that we get and need power from the Holy Spirit to overcome our temptations to sin and to discern God's will for our lives and to show that cross-shaped love to others. So we can't swear off any ability or power as somehow idolatrous in and of itself. Like many of the things in our lives, Jesus sets an example for us. Luke 10, verses 17 through 20 is where we'll go next. This is toward the end of a passage where Jesus has sent out his 70 or 72 disciples to minister to the people in the land of Galilee. Right, this whole, everything from 10 verse 1 on through is the story of Jesus instructing them. And we come to the, the, their return at verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Jesus gave them authority. He gave them the ability to overcome the power of Satan right towards the end of each of the Gospels, he says, wait and the Holy Spirit will come. They waited and the Holy Spirit came, right? God, Jesus gave them the authority that in his name, the demons would be cast out, the people would be healed, that nothing would harm them. But they are not to rejoice even in the power they are given, right? That the demons listen, but that their names are written in heaven, that they are part of the kingdom of God, Squashing the enemy through Jesus' authority. This doesn't speak to our whole lives, but it is a great place to start. And actually, there's been some deliverance ministries happening with Unison. So we can thank God that he delivers you from whatever is oppressing you. Uh, But don't yourselves glory in the authority, right? Rejoice that the Lord is with you. That's enough. Leverage the power Jesus gives against the enemy and rejoice at your citizenship in heaven. Now, lastly, I want to point to uh, one verse, talk about it for a minute, and then we'll close. The verse is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear their land. Don't amen me yet. I I grew up hearing this verse quoted to the church, at church, more than once a month, as if it was the antidote to all the problems America was facing as a nation. But we take this passage out of context if we apply it to America, okay? God's people today is the church, not America. This promise is to Israel, okay? Okay? So God has instructed us to follow him in other ways, not with a direct promise like this that we see fulfilled here, or that we find in this verse. Yes, he made a covenant with the nation of Israel before, 
But since the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that covenant has applied not to one particular nation, but with all those among, who, among all nations who would follow Jesus. Right? That what Chase was saying about communion is that this new covenant means that we get to be part of it without becoming ethnically and religiously Jewish. We get to be part of God's kingdom. You can read Ephesians 2. It's eye-opening. Honestly, read Ephesians 2, and you'll be like, huh. Anyway, we're not the recipients of that promise in 2 Chronicles 7. We ignore Jesus' teachings and what they mean if we place ourselves there. In a similar way, we can, we can look at what the principle means and, and go from there. But just because we, as a nation, may humble ourselves, may pray, or may convince enough people to turn from their wicked ways, that doesn't, it's not a one plus one equals two. God will bless our land. That's, God's promises are not for America. They're not. Nations come, nations go. The, you know, the flower, what is it? Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Well, grass and flowers, they're in nations, so it works, right? Nations come and go, okay? So as we go, consider how you might take power or any nation off the the highest throne of your life. Because power, according to the world, is off limits for Christians, off limits for the Christ follower. It's not the way we're called to operate in the world. But power to follow God is available for anyone who asks for it. Will you join me in prayer, please? God, we trust you. We trust everything we need to come from you. Lord, I ask that you would squash the kingdoms of the devil, that you would come back soon and make all things right. Lord, I ask that you would uh, work on our hearts to turn away from this idolatrous idea that America is your chosen people. God, save us from that error. Let us live in the, the culture of the kingdom of God, rejecting power according to the world and accepting and praising you uh, that we're part of your kingdom. Lord, I ask that you would uh, figure, that you would help us figure out how to do this each week as we go. And um, we commit this service to you, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.